So our topic is Asia driving the world's economic transformation, which is a big task to do in about now. But let me just frame it uh, in this way. Uh, so clearly, um, Asia's the growth engine for the world, um, growing 3.9% according to the IMF last year, 4.6% this year, um, contributing about two-thirds of all global growth. Uh, global growth, that is the whole thing, global growth expected to be 4.2%, uh, down from 4.4% was the IMF's estimate in April. China is expected to grow 5% this year and 4.2% uh, in 2024. The IMF also notes that um, Asian inflation is generally less than elsewhere. Now, we're not really looking at an economic outlook in this session. We're just talking about how Asia is driving the economic transformation of the world. And I, I, I was racking my, my, my brain starting to think, well, how can I kind of illustrate how, um, how this is working? But also, what, what a lot of people are talking about these days is the geopolitics. And you've heard a lot of it already in the last couple of days. Geopolitics looms large with a lot of decisions being made by businesses and by uh, countries in terms of even their economic policy. The way I look at it is there's a weaponization of everything, everywhere, all at once. Even things that we didn't think could be weaponized, whether it's uh, PPEs or uh, US dollar or um, uh, what have you, uh, in terms of goods, uh, these things are now weaponized in the sense that people have to start thinking geopolitically in order to make economic decisions. So, uh, how does that work? I have to put the microphone down, and just briefly. I'm a man with two iPhones. I'm probably a little unusual. Right. Huh? This one iPhone. The white one. Got the shiny one. one. No. Ah, this one. one. The dark one. Which is actually broken. So this one that's broken, I didn't really look after it very well, is Apple iPhone 14 that's assembled in China. Right? This one is exactly the same model, iPhone 14. But this one is assembled in India. I got this one. This is my Hong Kong phone provided by my Hong Kong service provider. This is my US phone, provided by my US service provider, made in India, assembled in India, sorry, and assembled in China. I didn't really take care of the China one, it's all tracked up, but I don't know if that means anything. I, I will just report that the Indian iPhone is quite a bit lighter than the China iPhone. I don't know what that quite means, but I can tell you it is a bit lighter. This is geopolitics right here in my hand. Right? Why is Apple now making uh, or getting Foxconn, more precisely, to assemble Apple iPhones, including the latest iPhone, entirely in India? That's a geopolitical uh, question. That's geopolitical. It's about geopolitics. Um, there's a very good article that came out this morning, sent to me by my office, in uh, a publication called Rest of the World that explains how there are Chinese engineers, as we speak, in Tamil Nadu in India, training Indian workers to produce the latest iPhone entirely. That's commercial decision making based on geopolitical concerns, geopolitical factors. What we're going to discuss here is not so much the geopolitics, but we're going to try to discuss how Despite the geopolitics, there's a lot happening in terms of what Asia is trying to do, what Asian economies are trying to do in terms of driving not only their growth, but the world's growth. And we can never escape, however, the geopolitical concerns. So they'll certainly be woven into our discussion. But here, we're going to try to talk about how um, the economic choices that many of these companies and countries that are represented here are driven not necessarily just by economic and commercial concerns, the 
use will lead to make a profit or satisfy stakeholders or, and now of course, ESG concerns, but also the geopolitics. But we'll try to minimize the geopolitics a bit because I think we, we all know about all the concerns. So what I'm going to do, uh, first, is uh, start with our uh, brief, in a brief introduction of um, our panelists. So, uh, all the way to my right is uh, Yuan Yi, who is the uh, chairman of Ho Chi Minh City Securities Corporation here in Vietnam. Welcome, uh, Yuan. Uh, next to him is Kali Huang, the president and chief executive officer of DigiTimes in Taiwan. Welcome. Next to me is my longtime friend, known since the 1980s, um, sorry, I don't mean to say it anyway, but, uh, is Lisa Botos, who's the founding partner of MB, MMBP Private Partners in Singapore, which is a, a firm, a boutique firm that deals in developing and investing cultural capital, which we, she'll talk about uh, as we go along. And then right uh, to my left is Murat Sidney uh, sorry, I, I, I tried. Um, <laughs> chairman of the Integral Group in Switzerland, who really is uh, uh, at the forefront of um, developments in the Caspian Sea area. Uh, and then, just to the furthest uh, left there, uh, Charles Tang, who is president of Brazil China, the Brazil China Chamber of Commerce. So, welcome you all. If I could start with Johan. Johan, can you please uh, uh, talk, talk to us a bit from your perspective? Um, especially Vietnam being one of the more important uh, economies now, not just in ASEAN and Southeast Asia, but maybe in Asia and in the world. Um, Bloomberg recently did a study to try to identify five economies, the economies that are what they call connectors in the world, truly trying to bring together, in some ways exercising their agency in this context of the U.S.-China rivalry still trying to make their way and by making the right choices in their own interest and connecting different parts of the world, connecting with China, connecting with the U.S. and everyone in between. And Vietnam and Indonesia in this part of the world were two uh, economies identified as those connections. So tell us a bit about the Vietnam, Vietnam story and where you see uh, Vietnam is now driving the growth, not just in ASEAN, but in the wider region. Thank you, Al. Um, I think to begin with, uh, instead of all, all, all the numbers, and of course I don't remember all the numbers, maybe I can tell, I think a couple of minutes, tell people a uh, uh, short story of my uh, observation about uh, Vietnam's growth over the last 20 years. And it's, uh, it's uh, nothing short of uh, being a miracle. Uh, we don't like to uh, here, but uh, uh, having been on the ground for, for more than 20 years, I've seen Vietnam transforming um, from, uh, and this is what I saw 20 years ago, I saw um, most of the people who ate in restaurants and five star hotels were foreigners, and the Vietnamese people were eating on the street. And 20 years later now, we see, or I see, uh, mostly people who eat in nice restaurants are Vietnamese people and the foreigners are eating on the street. And I think that tells a transformation story about Vietnam because basically 20 years ago Vietnam was a, uh, a basic uh, manufacturing and export um, economy and so the people who were sitting in the restaurants were the expats who came and worked for the FDI companies, the foreign direct investor, investment companies, whereas the local uh, Vietnamese people were basically factory workers and what have you, uh, who ate on the street and there was no uh, significant middle class in Vietnam to, to, to speak of. Now, uh, what we see is basically uh, a uh, budding middle class um, in Vietnam and 
those are people who are eating in restaurants. And the people who eat on the street are tourists, foreign tourists. Uh, and so I think we are seeing uh, a few additional components uh, to the development of the Vietnamese economy in addition to what we just uh, FDI and, and uh, low uh, manufacturing export uh, from 20 years ago. So now we're seeing, um, obviously the first one that we noticed uh, are the, the consumer class, the, the middle class in Vietnam, which is a local economy, uh, and tourism, um, but also in terms of uh, the FDI and export based economy, we see that Vietnam now exports, uh, the biggest export items from Vietnam are Samsung um, mobile headsets um, and, and, and other electronic uh, items, in addition to the basic agricultural products and uh, garment and footwear uh, as, as it was before. Um, so Vietnam is um, gradually becoming a more significant economy um, in uh, the overall global um, economy. Um, but I would like to come back to the term that you use, uh, Al, which is uh, Vietnam being a connector. And I think if we go back a couple of hundred years, um, we can uh, already see that Vietnam was uh, a connecting point um, between uh, North Asia and South Asia. And I suppose um, uh, that was a, a very good reason for Vietnam being uh, a part of to Indochina because it's, uh, it's, uh, Vietnam sits uh, in between the two biggest uh, economies and cultures uh, in Asia, being China and India. And so I think Vietnam continues, uh, obviously, for, 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 um, because of the war, because of uh, various other geopolitical uh, juxtaposition uh, over the last couple of hundred years, that uh, I think Vietnam. Uh, is only emerging um, as a new economy over the last um, 30 years or so. Um, and so, um, uh, I think, I think uh, uh, being a connector uh, uh, in the past has allowed Vietnam to continue uh, going forward now with the, uh, with the, with the uh, global uh, economic you, you know, um, part of that, I think, is infrastructure. I wonder if you talk about the role that infrastructure is there. I mean, we think about mainland China and its success. Um, we think about the BRI in terms of China's motivation for promoting the BRI, which a lot of it is to do with let's build infrastructure so we can have better trading and commercial relations with our partners. But for Vietnam, it's, infrastructure has been an important aspect of that transformation. Definitely, um, but in, in, in the aspect of infrastructure development, I think Vietnam uh, is, uh, in, in my view, Vietnam is an underdog uh, in the sense that um, uh, given the fact that Vietnam is a long geographical area, a long country rather than, than a wide country, um, uh, there are some challenges in regard to its uh, 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 road infrastructure. Uh, and uh, Vietnam uh, is still talking about developing a high-speed uh, railway network, uh, which is um, going to take some time uh, for Vietnam to achieve that. Um, although Vietnam uh, has some of the significant advantages in, in terms of having a long coastline, and uh, I think um, uh, Vietnam uh, should and, 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 and has the, the uh, opportunity to develop uh, additional uh, facilities uh, like uh, deep sea ports uh, that could facilitate uh, the, the transport of goods uh, from uh, North Asia to South Asia. Well, that's the important aspect of ter in terms of being a connector, being able to, to be that. I mean, Singapore is a success to a large extent is because it, it, it 
think China will die. And uh, I think Joe Pong, the former prime minister, once uh, mentioned how Singapore could uh, take uh, to, could, could bring in ice cream from Australia and without uh, batting an eyelash, set it off uh, board and not worry about it. Uh, colleague, if I can uh, talk to you about the, 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 the um, uh, technology, uh, and, and particularly focus, you've been focusing on Korea and Taiwan. Um, we're now in a digitized world, uh, and yet there are those outside of Asia who think that we're not as digitized as they might be, but indeed the reality is, of course, that we're extremely digitized in, in many of our economies to the point that particularly in mainland China, and I know it's true in, in, in Taiwan, and um, maybe less so in Hong Kong, but uh, that um, if you aren't digitized, sometimes it's harder to make a transaction if you're, if, 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 if you're not fully digitized. Um, so tell us a bit about how technology developments, particularly in Korean Taiwan, are driving um, that transformation in our economies here, but also really teaching the world about the, the benefits and the advantages of Thank you. Uh, it's my very honor to come here to join this, this panel. And uh, you mentioned about the uh, iPhone. That's a good example of us to understand uh, geopolitics. And uh, maybe you didn't know that almost 100% of the mobile phone, iPhone, produced by Taiwanese makers. And also 50% of the application process is also produced by Taiwanese and but for five or seven company you mentioned about Foscom, their gross margin last quarter, I mean third quarter this year, their gross margin was six point six percent. But you know, chairman is very different, very different. Last time I met him, I asked him how many employees you have. He told me what's on three million all my business. So low market C margin also creates a lot of unskilled average jobs. They do good for emerging market. This one. Secondly, I mentioned about uh, application process, 100% produced by KSMC. And uh, you may didn't know. Last year, KSMC gross margin as high as 55%. Net profit after tax, 42%. Which means last year, this company total revenue has been at 76 billion dollars, with uh, 34 billion dollars net profit after tax. Now, more than 90% of the most advanced chips produced by Taiwan's makers, and also for final assembly, also created by Taiwan's company. So now we work in this kind of project and very successful. At the end of last year in Taiwan, we have 949 listed electronic companies. They could start trading in the stock market. Even we only count those companies together. We don't count Intel, Microsoft, Apple, Google in Taiwan. Even we only count local companies. Their revenue last year has been as 953 billion dollars. They are very big. So we are the hub, real hub. For semiconductor, for final assembly as well. So we are lucky. But I would like to say that only two countries in the world taking this kind of operation. One is Taiwan, another is Korea. Maybe you didn't know, I studied in Korea two years. I speak Korean well better than my English. So people say I'm the best Korean expert in Taiwan. So they, they may too, because I studied Korea for 40, 40 years. And uh, only Taiwan and uh, Korea has local, native, high-tech industry. We have our own brands. We design them. And uh, the reason why Taiwan success, you mentioned about U.S. and about infrastructure. But what means for infrastructure? Do you know much about that? I would like to tell you that. This time, in my county, we have 244 workers. And in my county, actually, co-invested by industry. 40 years ago, 36 years ago, 
I want to start up my own business. I call me the students. I say I'm going to start up my own business. How much money will you give me? I ask just like a big price. I say how much money will you give me? And uh, everybody says yes. Because we know each other way. You know, to Taiwan. 90% of the high tech industry located high tech in the Shinto area. One hour distance. There is a reason why we have the infrastructure, we have the ecosystem, we even have a higher density than Silicon Valley, that we can work together. And 90% uh, in the year 2000, 90% of the local is produced by companies, especially from Taipei and the Shinto area, one hour distance, like, as a 60 kilometers. So we know very well about that. 38 years ago, I went back to Taiwan. Government recruited me as an analyst to build a think tank for Taiwan. So I'm the writer of Taiwan's computer industry development plan. I'm the popular, I'm the strategic planner for Shinto Science Park. Do you know how big the Shinto Science Park now? How many Shinto Science Park uh, that point with 170,000 people on there? With more than 100 billion results. So in the highest state of Best of course in the world, I believe in that. So they, they are very special. So, uh, as I mentioned, only Taiwan and Korea succeed. So, they never can try to understand what means for the construction. We have the best, the compact, bad reputation, boundary, companies, something like that. Now, Kongi, um, this begs the question in a world that is decoupling or fragmenting. De risky is the more polite term. How, how is that affecting those uh, technological developments in particularly those markets, which are very important? Um, and of course, the main, main of China and the issues wrapped up with it, particularly cross regulations, are all affecting. So, how do you see it? Yes, very true, but we're lucky. Before year 2000, we built the infrastructure. You know, all of the component transactions, all of we, we are aligned. Because we are either, we need to deal with global business companies, we need to deal with HP, Dell, or Apple, and we know how to deal with them. So there is only one case in the world. And it's, it's because population density high in the world as well, in Taiwan. So we know each other well, and uh, also this morning we have a lady from each. Each is located in Chichu. And I also teach in Chang University and the Chihuahua University as well. So we know that we have very good talent working in the in, in, in the field, in the, in the on the sites. So everybody knows that in Taiwan is a key country. And uh, maybe you didn't know about a quarter of Taiwan GDP directly contributed by electronic industry. So everybody knows that. So they the so called infrastructure we built before. Now, because even China trend war, so decentralized manufacturing is a mega trend. So we need to think about how to cope with Vietnam, how to cope with India, how to cope with Brazil, even Mexico. We need to think about that. But that's a very professional business. Very, very professional business. Personally, I even conduct a survey about which are the major countries they import SAT machine boxes. You know the SAT machine, right? Service mountain large insert, number insert. And which one, in which country is the biggest country import more? Both China. They import about 80% more. Then they buy America, Germany. And who is number one? Number one is Mexico. Number five is Vietnam. So I believe in the coming five years, Vietnam will consume a lot of components because they import SMT machinery. So there is a background about the industry. Absolutely, they are very complicated issues because, as I mentioned, it's a one trillion US dollars per person. And we need to deal with them. And we need to deal with uh, you, you. I would like to place the last example for you. You mentioned about the Apple, right? And uh, out of the Apple, they contribute. 23.5% of the TSMT revenue last year. 
with a higher than 50% growth margin. And here's a typical model is an upside down triangle model. Why we call upside down? Because 7 nanometer, 5 nanometer, and 3 nanometer, they contribute. 59% of the revenue case in the last quarter. I mean, third quarter this year. So we know that kind of things very well. I don't need to memorize. That is very easy. Because every day I run that kind of things in my work. So infrastructure, information base, quality of the information also very important. So today, if we come to eat, come to Vietnam, we want to help Vietnam. Also, Vietnam friends need to understand. There is a professional person. And how many companies, what kind of companies, import from Korea, import from Japan, import from Taiwan, or run in from Hong Kong. So we need to understand the kind of so called logistics and warehouse. I have another ID. I'm the old member of China Airlines Taiwan. And that's why I know the logistics. You may need to know the top five air cargo airport in the world, ranked by Hong Kong and Eastern Korea. Third one is Pudong, Shanghai. Number four is Taoyuan, Taiwan. Number five is Narita, Japan. And all in Eastern China Sea. So if open fire between China and Taiwan, there is a disaster for everyone. There is a very huge disaster. So even beyond our imagination. So that's why I, I, I try to make So the, those are risks then that should prevent that kind of uh, deterioration of relations. Now, Connie, you bring up some issues that, of course, um, you, to fuel that growth, to fuel that development of infrastructure, um, Asia needs to have energy security, uh, particularly going forward uh, with um, the need to be environmentally responsible. And, such. and that means continuing to be uh, connected to um, various markets and in markets. And, um, Gora, I'm, I'm wondering if you could talk to us about um, what you see in terms of the area that you know very well and the relationships that have developed with uh, or better word, core <coughs> markets that we've been talking about. Uh, maybe I will a little bit uh, explain uh, about the region. Uh, I will talk about the Great Caspian region. It's 18 countries uh, with Caspian Sea in the center, uh, Central Asia, uh, Afghanistan, Pakistan, uh, Caucasus, and the Black Sea countries. And uh, uh, this is a big region, and uh, uh, it was historically very important for this world. It was uh, a really crossroads of civilizations and the transit routes and ancient Silk Road was detected going there to our more than 2,000 years ago. That's why this region was connected to Asia really plus. Uh, thousand years, and uh, uh, this region became uh, now critically important for this world uh, because of the food security and energy security. And uh, if you know now, it's a top 20 going on in Dubai, and uh, uh, it is a goal to fully eliminate the fossil fuels in the very nearest time. Uh, but uh, this is a very ambitious and uh, the goal which is very difficult to reach. But uh, uh, there could be a different sub goals. Uh, different ways how to uh, go to the carbon neutrality, but at least uh, to reduce the negative effect uh, for the nature, for the, for the nature and climate, or the fossil fuels. And here I will talk about the uh, natural gas. So natural gas is a transitional, a transitional fuel. It's not so pollutive uh, like coal, even not so pollutive like oil and other products. Uh, at the same time, of course, there is a certain quantity of carbon dioxide will be emitted. And, uh, since the uh, last 12 years, the uh, Greater Caspian region, in particular country from where I'm originally from, is Turkmenistan, became very important for the natural gas supply to Asia, in particular to China. And uh, in 2011, there was a uh, Turkmenistan uh, China gas pipeline was built to the air. And, uh, uh, and uh, I think this is a good example uh, about the cooperation between the Greater Caspian region. China but also Asia. Uh, now we are coming uh, for the fertilizers, for example, is, uh, uh, and also for the uh, agri, agri commodity supply, which is also important for the global food security. And uh, uh, 
Well, thank you very much. So, sorry, if I might uh, with um, uh, Charles, because uh, we've talked about fossil fuels and natural gas, but uh, you, you're very much involved in uh, renewables. So, uh, tell us a bit about what you're doing in terms of connecting Brazil with uh, Asia, particularly China. Well, Brazil has a great interaction with Asia, especially in the BRICS. So, BRICS is expanding. And if you know, the President Lula of Brazil is, collaborates closely with China. And Brazil is a big exporting nation to China. In fact, in the last three years, Brazil's surplus trade with China exceeded $100 billion. It's about $85 billion of Chinese investment in Brazil. Mm -hmm. And talking about infrastructure, Chinese companies are also helping build the infrastructure of Brazil. Uh, infrastructure is the basis of economic development. Uh, I was a keynote speaker at Oxford University, and I mentioned that former colonial masters of Africa stripped Africa of its wealth and left Africa as a forgotten continent for many decades until China started investing massively into the infrastructure of most of the African nations. And if you take a look at the statistics, the fastest growing nations in the world have been the African countries. China invested massively into the infrastructure. There were many key leaders of the African nations in the audience, like the President Paul Kagame and so on, of Rwanda. And, you know, Brazil is a very clean country in the sense that Brazil has a lot of hydropower, hydroelectric power. And 55 years ago, Brazil launched ethanol program. So all the cars in Brazil, all the vehicles in Brazil can utilize renewable energy ethanol or gasoline. Now, as the president of the Brazilian Association of Waste to Energy and Hydrogen, we are wanting to utilize the tremendous amount of wasted garbage, uh, which is a uh, raw material for green energy, as Brazil will be one of the major exporters of hydrogen to Europe. And in terms of ecology, you know, I think Asian nations should also be prepared. As I mentioned earlier, uh, in, after 1926, people who export to Europe will have to pay a cost. In terms of your connection to China, what you're working on in hydrogen, Well, we, I'm a part of a British company that detains a Israeli patent that we have developed a hydrogen storage tank that does not need compression because the present technology, you have to compress the hydrogen over 700 bars and that of course has a danger of exploding. Other people are transporting, want to transport hydrogen form of ammonia, which is also very dangerous to handle and explosive. So the hydrogen storage tank that we have developed, or the Israelis have developed, can store almost five times more hydrogen than the compressed uh, technology. And as you know, the future is hydrogen, and the stumbling block is the storage. In the future, when you go to the fuel stations, there won't be any gasoline or diesel. And this is a quick charge. We have a quick charge, electric quick charge and hydrogen pumps. And this is something you're working with in terms of transferring technology to this part of the world? We're, 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 you know, the problem with geopolitics yeah. is that, you know, our American partners are uh, reluctant for us to license Chinese companies uh, and uh, we want to license Chinese companies or American companies or, or any company, you know, we 
don't want to become involved in politics, in geopolitics, but unfortunately, you know, it's a reality. And, you know, aside from the difficulties of normal international business, now we have an additional complication, which is geopolitics. But this kind of technology makes sense for this part of the world. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, like I said, Brazil will be one of the major exporters of green hydrogen to Europe and how we can transport it. You know, and the airplanes and the ships and the trains, etc. will be, you know, will use hydrogen as a fuel. Well, thank you very much. Uh, now, if I could just turn to um, Lisa, last but not least. But, um, we often are talk, we're talking a lot about geopolitics, even if we want to avoid it, it, it keeps coming up. But you deal in cultural capital, and we invest in cultural capital, and perhaps using that to drive new growth, particularly, say, in tourism, or in uh, cultural exchange, the traditional people-to-people -people industries. Uh, tell us a bit about what you do, and how you see in particular, or companies in this part of the world that are driving that more soft power investment? It's on? Yeah. Yes. Great. Thank you so much for inviting me here. It's really interesting um, to get a chance to talk a bit about the cultural dimension and the cultural component of everything everyone's saying. Um, basically, I mean, no matter what, I think one thing is. Culture is an underutilized tool, and it's just a tool. And when you're looking at all of these issues, like geopolitical, economic, um, you know, technology, and everything, the conversation, if you bring like, the idea of, of culture into that conversation, then you start to bring other dimensions. So you might be just thinking about certain like sales. Let's say you're just trying to sell something. Just KPI around that. But there might be other more indirect ways to help work with that or even amplify that. Um, so, for instance, like if you think about um, tourism, so often tourism is a concept that, I mean, when people are thinking about it, I'm thinking about maybe cultural heritage, especially in this region, and very much looking at hospitality, looking at um, properties, uh, cult, uh, you know, tours of product. But actually, it's a really, really great opportunity to actually think about like, the larger vision of, of that country. Like, where, where is the country going? What are the assets that are there? You know, often there's like, you know, maybe the country, like many of the countries are going through a lot of transformation. We really know this. And what are you communicating? Are you communicating the same stories that people want to see, you think they want to see it, or is this an opportunity to amplify what is actually happening in that country and create energy when people are coming and when you're speaking to them, they get a sense of like, maybe you have an incredibly youthful population that is like very, very strong, um, young, very well educated, English speaking, let's say, um, population with a lot of aspiration. Not known. And so when people are visiting, all of a sudden, if you're really looking around, you might see opportunities for FDI. You might see, like, wow, this is a place I want to connect with. Um, let me give you an example. So basically, uh, last year, yeah. okay, sorry. Um, last year, uh, we, uh, my partner and I, we worked with the Kingdom of Bhutan. And this country, is going through this incredible transformation at every single level of society, from the civil service, to the banking, to um, digitization of culture. It's a carbon sink. I mean, things that are known about it as a beautiful landscape. There's, there's some misconception that it's remote. You know, maybe that people are very simple and happy in the world, in the life that they live. But actually, it's extremely well educated, very literary. Even when you go to visit farmers, handed a book that they wrote. Like, there's a lot of incredible thinking, a lot, you know, PhDs, uh, 
uh, masters, and there's even a blockchain masters program in in uh, Bhutan. There's a there's a space program, but there's still that history, um, which which goes throughout. Like, so it's like there's a thread between past, present, and future. And when you're there, you have a country with a lot of aspirations. Young people, median age of 26 years old, that that have aspirations and that actually can, and, and they're very entrepreneurial. So there's just this different energy there. So when we were working with them, with our partners, and we just listened. So part of like being like thinking about culture, it's like a long-term thing. It's listening and trying to understand what's going on here and what are these elements that can be brought into it, uh, into this picture. And so essentially, when we were working with the country, everything that we did, we created. We worked with them to create a new national identity, which is called. And yes, gross national happiness is incredibly important. However, it's um, how it's known that happiness is a place was actually a tourism campaign that became a de facto national identity. But the country that's going through all this transformation and has all this potential, human potential, um, and also it has the you know the ecology, they are at the forefront of. of understanding like being a carbon sink. And and they also have like other um, they have other industries like hydroelectric power. So there's a lot of things happening there that people don't know. And there is an aspiration for foreign direct investment, but you have to know what's happening in that to understand. When we talked uh, earlier you, you said something to the effect that um, sometimes leading with culture is the best way to solve business challenge and to contribute to long-term growth. It is not an ESG, you say, or nice to have, but essential. I want to just very briefly explain uh, what you're thinking. This is, so sometimes I mean, I'll just think about like a, 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 a property company, um, actually Swagger Properties that I've worked with in the past. And so basically, when, we're talk, when, when people think about, like, let's just say art, let's just say art, a lot of, a lot of uh, maybe companies think like it's a nice thing. I'm going to invest a little bit in an art project here, or maybe I'll give a space to a young artist and put something on the wall. But that doesn't have a sustainable like effect, and doesn't really grow your own company's cultural capital. How you're seen um, contributing to to this industry, to this ecosystem, to which which feeds back into I mean. Full ecosystems in any city, in any country, have all these elements that work together and they intertwine and they create a um, tapestry that actually says something about the country, you know, it says something and, and, and opens up opportunities for even like pipelines for, you know, for, for uh, other projects. But basically, so just going back to like one project with Swire, like they have definite ideas about what there's an area called Taipei Place, Taipei and it is kind of a city within a city. This is in Hong Kong. In Hong Kong, and it and it and it, um, and it functions, you know, as a whole. Like it could be like almost like a city within a city, and there was certain ideas about how to maybe bring people in from other parts of Hong Kong to come see this event that we are putting on this this art project. And there was also, you know, you're thinking about you want to bring more tenants into, you know, uh, commercial tenants into these, you know, these pro this property development. Yes, you can go out and do sales, you can do marketing in certain places, or we went in a more indirect route. I mean, we created this incredible event that was, it was an exhibition, it was a museum show, it also dealt with architecture, it was like architecture meets fashion meets uh, a proper museum show, film, cuisine, bringing in a Michelin star chef, but it was integrated. It was all thought of as the same way. Because it, and this really helped raise the, what you say, the cultural capital of this space, um, in this place. And so people didn't necessarily only think of it in one way, but actually, they started to become in this in this case this particular area like 
a little bit more of the whole ecosystem and conversation. And very important, especially if we're tapping that middle class that was spoken of. If you want them to spend, if you want them to invest in their children uh, and their futures, this is a key thing. Right, and, you, and then it's not, one, it's not just one thing, not one directional. But you understand that by bringing things together, it sparks ideas for the next generation. We're not siloed. They're, 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 they're talking and they're thinking in horizontal, you know, vertical, and, and diagonal ways, and they're crossing and bridging a lot of different things. And so allowing for that and making some room for that and creating new culture, like where, you know, new space for a country, for a business, for a family, um, but still having a vision. There always has to be structure. You have to have a vision and a mission, and then how do you get there? And this is just one of the tools that should sit at the table with all the other tools. Great. Thank you very much, Lisa. I was told that uh, I could go five minutes over. Uh, we're right at the end of time. But so I'm going to use that five minutes by doing one more round. Uh, I was hoping to look out to the uh, audience, but Instead, I'm going to go around and, and ask each panelist in the same order in which we went um, to please, what is the chief challenge you see going forward for the economy or the economies that you're familiar with in terms of maintaining that growth trajectory and continuing to contribute to the economic transformation you know, that we've been talking about? Um, Okay. Um, I yes, so, so uh, uh, Johan, sorry, I just stopped it. Johan, I, I might be very interested in what you have to say because I think one of the challenges for Vietnam is going up the value of the chain. Right? And I think that if you looked at the contribution of FDI companies in terms of export, the FDI companies still have a, got a lion's share of those exports. So it just suggests that um, the local knowledge capital Education system. Uh, even Vietnam is a very good education system. I'm not saying that this should be your challenge, but um, how do you see it uh, going forward for Vietnam? And then we'll go to Holly and then uh, so all things considered. Yeah, well, just what is the big challenge you see? Right? Yeah, I think personally, I see the biggest challenge in Vietnam is uh, how to uh, get the infrastructure development going uh, in at the same pace as economic growth. Because Vietnam has been growing, Vietnam's economy has been growing uh, quite rapidly over the last uh, 10, 15 years or so. Uh, but the infrastructure development, for a lot of reasons, has not been able to keep up with it. And I think it has to do with everything. It has to do with uh, energy uh, distribution efficiency. Uh, because without energy, then you can't build uh, data centers, for example, because the, 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 the power source is not reliable. Then, if you don't have uh, the, uh, the data um, centers, then uh, you won't be able to to uh, uh, you utilize technology as a significant component within the infrastructure development. However, I think uh, on the positive side, I think uh, the, the most um, noteworthy thing in Vietnam that I can mention is the, the Vietnam's ability to leapfrog some of these uh, challenges. So for example, in terms of technology, Vietnam is probably still behind a lot of countries, but uh, in terms of the latest technology, like artificial intelligence and, uh, and uh, um, uh, what I mean with that respect, uh, I think Vietnam has been able to catch on quite uh, rapid, quite, quite fast. So I think that's going to be Vietnam's uh, uh, lesson. Uh, Colin, please. Uh, yeah, please. thank you. I think uh, to develop high technology is impossible to develop 10 years overnight. It's impossible. You know, Taiwan developed a new generation high technology took about 14 years, especially from the beginning of the 1980s. I, I, I have the good news. I joined because I worked on the industry about 14 years already. I understand. How to develop the energy from scratch. Now we are different years, maybe two. Now we need to understand what's our operation, what's our strength, and what are the 
are constrained. So propagation is very important. I would like to suggest that now my friends also need to think about what are the pieces of perspective in future for Vietnam. So Taiwan, I would like to say that only one one thing is very, very easy. We are helpless because we are only a, a country to produce for others. We even don't have the brand name, even TSMC. So we produce high level end products for everyone. And we have the brand. we don't have the brand. Why is okay for a small country and it's so thank, thank you. you. Mira, for you the challenge uh, going forward uh, region. Yeah, although uh, we were trying to escape from geopolitical discussion, but the main challenge today for the Greater Caspian region is the geopolitics and the particular the war of the northern border of the region. And consequently, we are feeling that there are a lot of uh, investments in the region because everybody waits for what will happen with the war, and even lack of finance and the absence of willingness of the banks to finance even traditional business. And uh, of course, this affects the, the, the economies, it affects the development of the region. Great, and Charles. Going forward, I think uh, the challenges that uh, Asia or the whole world has to prepare for, not only ESG, and, uh, but also, you know, for example, the brick stations have been enlarged, doubled the size, and they're using local currencies rather than the U.S. dollar. And if that trend continues, I think people should be prepared or a change. It's not going to be tomorrow, but it's going to take some time for the uh, change of the uh, reserve currency. Yeah, so, I mean, of course there's many things, and this is kind of niche, but, um, but I would say there's a, there's a tension between um, you know, uh, heritage, the traditional culture, <laughs> And a and, and like looking into the future, contemporary contemporary culture, and I don't and I think it's a false like binary because actually I think there's a need for bridging many of the many of the countries and many of the cultures. There has to build. There is like there is there should be trust because a lot of the young people have a lot of that cultural uh, sense, those values, family values within within like you know. Find out with families and say, or with the, within the country, and then that they that actually you can take that you're not abandoning the past, but you're using that as a strength as you look forward and actually have a very future forward uh, view. And I would like say South Korea. Think about it. Centuries of history, very important, but look at where, where they are now. I mean, this powerhouse, soft power, and cultural capital. Great, thank you. Actually, one of uh, Vietnam's uh, uh, prominent chefs told me the other day that uh, it's all about food, and uh, Korea is doing a great job at it, and he wishes Vietnam did the same, and he said Thailand also did very well. So maybe we should all, uh, instead of uh, reading the news, we should just go and have a like, good, nice dinner. Um, but anyway, uh, thank you very much. I think what I get out of this is a key aspect for Asia's continued success in terms of particularly economies, and they're all facing many challenges, particularly today, is being that connector. So if there's any way to challenge the fragmenting world, the trend of fragmentation or decoupling or de-risking, it's let's build more connections, let's build a, a stronger network, let's expand uh, horizons and not just limit ourselves to getting obsessed about uh, the big boys who might be uh, uh, battling with uh, reach out and uh, create new growth that way. So thank you very much.